Hello everyone and welcome to the Fontaine Speculation miniseries finale! Today, I'll be going over almost everything we know about Fontaine, with some of my own speculations mixed in as well. This video has six main sections, those being lore, plot, characters, environment, enemies, and culture. Each of these is then split into smaller topics, which are all listed with timestamps in the description below. And for those of you who want to stay leak-free, don't worry, no leaks will be shown or mentioned in this video. If you have seen the leaks and want to talk about them in the comments, please be respectful and give a leak warning and enough space so that the read more option will appear. There may also be more official Fontaine teasers after the release of this video that I obviously can't talk about now, but I will be discussing them on my Twitter and Discord, as well as live over on my Twitch. And if you like this video, consider subscribing! As you can tell, this video is extremely long and took a lot of work, so I would appreciate that even more. With all that said though, let's get right into the video! The first section of this video is the lore of Fontaine, which will be going over events that happened in Fontaine's past. To start off, let's talk about the Archon War. The Archon War was a massive conflict that started around 3,700 years ago and ended 2,000 years ago. It affected all of Tevat, with gods fighting each other to claim one of the Seven Divine Thrones. In Mondstadt, Decarabian was slain by his people's rebellion, and Andreas conceded to the newly ascended Barbados. In Liyue, Morax along with the Adepti defeated countless other gods and monsters. In Inazuma, the twin gods Baal and Beelzebul claimed victory together, with Baal becoming the Archon. In Sumeru, the three god kings lived peacefully, with King Deshrit sharing his throne with Greater Lord Rukadavada and Nabu Malikata. However, as time went on, Deshrit and Nabu Malikata would both pass away, leaving Greater Lord Rukudavada as the Dendro Archon of the Seven. Now, at the moment, we don't know too many details of what happened in Fontaine during the Archon War. It can be assumed that the Lord of Amrita, the previous Hydro Archon, did win the Archon War in Fontaine. It could be possible, albeit unlikely, that there was another Archon before her that we just don't know about yet. Getting into the war itself though, the Fontaine teaser shown in the version 3.8 special program actually shows something that could be related to the Archon War. In the background of one scene, you can see what appears to be a giant bone sticking out from behind a small mountain. I think this could belong to a long dead god who was slain by the Lord of Amrita during the Archon War. Now there's also the matter of the mountains themselves. The shape of the mountains seen up close in the teaser almost seems a little unnatural, which makes me wonder if they were caused by a massive battle in the war. They somewhat resemble Guyun Stone Forest in Liyue, though these mountains seem to be far more eroded. Perhaps the mountains and the giant bone are connected, and both are a result of a battle between the dead god and the lord of Amrita. The dead god could have wielded Geo, causing pieces of the ground to rise up as spikes, while the Lord of Amrita defended against them using her Hydro abilities. It could also be possible that the Lord of Amrita fought against the dead god alongside Morax, the Geo Archon. If this area is close to Liyue, it is plausible that Morax could have traveled to Fontaine to assist the Lord of Amrita at some point during the war. I think more lore about interactions between Archons would be welcome, especially with them fighting together. Moving on from the Archon War though, it's time to talk about the Cataclysm. This was another massive event that affected all of Tevat, and it occurred 500 years ago. Thanks to the 3.6 artifact sets, Nymph's Dream and Vorokash's Glow, we actually know quite a bit on how the Cataclysm affected Fontaine. When the disaster began, Abyssal forces and forbidden knowledge poured out of Tunigi Hollow, located in Sumeru's Girdle of the Sands. The seven Archons were swiftly summoned to the area to fight, but not all of them made it out alive. 
At the moment, we know of three Archons who died as a result of the disaster. The first is Raiden Makoto, the original Electro Archon, who died in the subterranean nation of Kanria. The second is Greater Lord Rukadavada, the original Dendro Archon, who succumbed to the effects of forbidden knowledge. The third is the Lord of Amrita, the previous Hydro Archon, who was slain at Tunigi Hollow. Of course, I'll be focusing on what happened with the Lord of Amrita for this video. After her death, her body turned into a pool of sweet dew known as the Amrita. Greater Lord Rukadavada would then grow a massive tree known as the Harvest Stockum from the Amrita, which anchored the Hydro Archon's consciousness to the mortal realm. Her consciousness is specifically anchored in the Gyao Karina, which is the giant lotus within the center of the tree. Anyways, the Harvest Stockum would maintain the seal placed on Tunigi Hollow, keeping the forces of the Abyss at bay. Over time, though, the Abyssal Corruption would begin to take its toll on the tree, as shown by the appearance of the Sign of Apoosha. Upon seeing this, the Divine Bird Samurg would make her destined sacrifice, flying into the Pool of Amrita and shattering her form. This successfully saved the tree, causing the Sign of Apoosha to disappear as well. The Shards of Kyavarina that Samurg's form shattered into would also become the Pari, who worship the Harvest Stockum as their god. At some point after this, the Lockfolk of Fontaine would make a pilgrimage to the Vorokasho Oasis. The Lockfolk did not approve of Fosalor, the new Hydra Archon, so they came to the Oasis in search of their original Archon. When they arrived and saw the Harvest Stockum, though, they left, as it meant their Archon was gone. Also around this time, the researchers Rene, Jacob, and Carl would travel to the Girdle of the Sands from Fontaine. They would research the Harvest Stockum, as well as Conrian technology, likely bring this knowledge back with them to Fontaine. The stories of the Harvest Stockum and these researchers are covered more extensively in my Vorokasha's Glow and Nymph's Dream videos respectively, so I recommend you check those out. Back in Fontaine, we're not exactly sure how things unfolded. I believe there may have been a good amount of unrest, as the Hydro Archon was killed at Tunigi Hollow. At the moment, we don't know how long the gap between the Lord of Amrita's death and Fosalor's ascension was. It could have been quick, taking a few days or even hours, or the sea could have been empty for months or years. The other Archons had their seats filled pretty much right away, with A being able to fill in for Makoto, and Nahida being born right after Rukadavada died. It would be interesting to see a nation that didn't have such a smooth transition from one Archon to the next. Whatever happened in Fontaine likely changed the nation in a few ways, given that the Lockfolk left as a result of the new Archon. In modern times, Fontaine is ruled by Fosalor, the Hydro Archon, with the Court of Fontaine likely acting as the main governing body. Law is big in Fontaine, with Yanfei saying that their legal system is notoriously complex. The punishments of this system seem to be quite severe as well, with Patrice saying that even the tiniest infractions are considered crimes. Even so, Fontaine is quite an advanced nation, having technologies second only to Shnezhnaya. This technology was spearheaded by Elaine Guillotine shortly after the Cataclysm, a character who was also mentioned in Renee's investigation notes. This advancement does have a downside though, as Santon tells us that the air is toxic in Fontaine, likely due to it being an industrial nation. The Fontaine Research Institute, which was founded by Elaine Guillotine, was also recently rocked by a massive explosion. The explosion was caused by an experiment that was aimed at solving Fontaine's waterline crisis using a material called Archeum. Senior technician Edwin Eastinghouse was the one who conducted the experiment, and the explosion ended up killing him. Back in the version 3.2 run of Marvelous Merchandise, though, Lieben tells us that Fontaine is quite dangerous and oppressive at the moment. He describes the locals as being quite antsy, saying that some type of judgment is soon to come. This judgment will likely be related to the Arc Conquests of Fontaine, so I think it's time to get into the plot.
The plot section of this video will focus on a few different groups and the roles that they could play within the main Archon quests of Fontaine. The first of these groups that I want to talk about is the Hexen Circle. The Hexen Circle was formally introduced to us in the Windbloom's Breath event in version 3.5, where we get a cutscene about them. However, even with this cutscene, the group is still shrouded in mystery. We were introduced to the names of some of the members though, those being A or Alice, B or Barbaloth, R or Rhindaughter, N or Nicole, J or I Ivanovna N, and M or Anders' daughter. As a group, the Hexen Circle has done a lot of crazy things, including challenging the Animo Archon himself. However, he insisted that they make music, not war, and so the mages decided to meet in various places for formal tea parties instead. The group also conducts Erminsel explorations, which could explain some of their abilities. Alice has been described as near omnipotent by Albedo, Barbaloth is a master in hydromancy, and Rhindaughter created many beings, including Durin, the Rifthounds, and Albedo. The Traveler also theorizes that Nicole was the one who spoke to them at the end of the Inversion of Genesis interlude Archon quest, as she helps guide people towards the truth when a change occurs in the world. As for why I think they may appear in Fontaine, the Hexen Circle or its members have been appearing in certain quests and events a lot more often in the version 3.x updates. Nicole spoke to us during Inversion of Genesis in 3.3, we got our formal introduction during Windbloom's Breath in 3.5, and the main event of 3.8 is likely going to have information on the Hexen Circle as well. Alice also was the voiceover for the Fontaine teaser in the 3.8 special program, which could be a little hint as well. All of these references to the Hexen Circle in version 3.x quests and events remind me of Scaramouche, who got more lore during various quests and events in the version 2.x updates, before appearing in the Sumeru Archon quests. As for their role in Fontaine, I still believe that there could be some sort of witch trials going on in the nation. There were real-life witch trials that occurred in France, and with Fontaine being the Nation of Justice, it could work quite well. In the 3.8 Fontaine teaser, Alice hinted that the Melusine were more suspicious of Outlanders lately, saying that they wouldn't usually act without authorization and accuse an innocent person. The witches of the Hexen Circle are incredibly powerful, and Rhyndaughter was even involved with the Cataclysm, if some of the witches appear in Fontaine, it would make sense for Fosalor to be wary of them and try to have them arrested. The involvement of the mages could also tie the Lockfolk in, as the Cataclysm took away the Lord of Amrita, something that they probably want justice for. I think that Fontaine's story will also be more related to the Divine, as the nation is below Celestia. The Hexen Circle is likely familiar with the Divine, especially given that they go on Erminsel expeditions. If they end up being directly involved in Fontaine's Archon quest, there is potential for some celestial consequences. Moving on from the Hexen Circle though, I want to talk about the Fatui and what they'll be up to in Fontaine. The Fatui have been involved in every nation's story so far, and have successfully obtained the Gnosis from each nation. The Animo Gnosis was obtained forcefully by La Senora, who also later peacefully obtained the Geonosis in a contract. In Inazuma, she was killed before she could obtain the Electronosis, but it was obtained by Scaramouche instead. After Scaramouche was defeated by the Traveler in Sumeru, Nahida took the Electronosis from him. Dottore then obtained both the Electro and Dendronosis from Nahida in exchange for some knowledge. We also fought a Harbinger as a weekly boss in Liyue, Inazuma, and Sumeru, but I'll talk more about that in the enemies section of the video. As for what the Fatui could be up to in Fontaine, I have two main ideas. The first is that the Fatui will help out with Fontaine's energy crisis, using technology from Shnezhnaya. Their help in solving this crisis could then be used as leverage to peacefully obtain the Hydronosis from Fosalor. As for the Harbingers that would be involved in this plot, I think Tatori and Sandroni would both be good fits. Both of them have worked with Ruin Guards and other technologies, 
and Sandrone especially fits the steampunk aesthetic of Industrial Fontaine. The other plot idea is that the Fatui are working behind the scenes to set up certain trials to gain favor with Fosalor. Once again, this could be used as leverage to peacefully obtain the Hydronosis, or it could be a way for the Harbingers to gain Fosalor's trust, only to take her Gnosis when she least expects it. Now, the trials here could tie back into the Witch Trials with the Hexen Circle, but it could also lead to the Traveler being arrested. Perhaps the Fatui could find a way to portray the Traveler as a villain and get them arrested, maybe even using their presence in Tenshukaku when Senora died as reasoning. As for the Harbingers who would be involved in this plot, I think Arlecchino and Columbina would fit quite well. Arlecchino seemed to empathize with Senora more than some of the other Harbingers in A Winter Night's Lazo, and Columbina seems to be linked to Celestia in some way. However, I think Dottori and Columbina might have other roles to play in future nations, so I'm thinking they might either save them for later, or have them play a minor role as compared to the other Harbingers in Fontaine. Arlecchino and Sandrone both fit well into the aesthetics of Fontaine, and I think they are likely to be the ones we mainly encounter. Arlecchino's title is the Knave, which is another term for Jack in cards. This could then be a reference to Jack the Ripper, which would fit with her wolf in sheep's clothing personality. Sandrone fits the industrial aesthetic of Fontaine, given her fancy outfit and ruin guard. I think that she'll be somewhat like Signora and Liyue, or Dottori and Sumeru, in that we encounter her a few times, but don't fight. I'll talk more about the Harbingers later on in the video, but for now, I'd like to talk about the Archons of Fontaine. Fontaine has had two different Archons, those being the Lord of Amrita, who was the original, and Fosalor, who became the Archon after the Cataclysm. While we don't know too much about them, it's safe to say that they are quite different from each other. After all, the Lockfolk left Fontaine and did not recognize Fosalor as their new Archon. Now, Fosalor has been described by Chief Justice Nouvellette as prone to hysterics, while the Lord of Amrita was likely much more refined, given that the Lockfolk praise purity. Fosalor also wants to judge all other gods, while the Lord of Amrita sent out the Lockfolk as spies to connect everyone in the world. Overall, Fosalor seems a lot more childish than her predecessor, a trait which will likely be explored within the Archon quests and her story quests. During either one of those quests, we could get an arc where she learns more about her predecessor and starts to mature a bit. We could take a trip back to the Harvest Stockholm with her, and the Pari could tell the story of the Lord of Amrita and the sacrifice she made all those years ago. Fosalor could then try to reach out to the Lockfolk, or perhaps the Lockfolk will sense pure waters flowing from Fontaine and return to find the cause. If this arc starts during our trial, the Archon quest could somewhat focus on this arc. Arlecchino could be present during our trial, and upon realizing that we are trying to help Fosalor, she would try and forcefully take the Hydronosis then and there. She would end up being unsuccessful, and we would work with some friends in Fontaine to protect Fosalor from Arlecchino. Perhaps Arlecchino could even take over the court for part of the story, using its authority to arrest innocent people to try and force Fosalor out of hiding. Eventually, this would lead to a confrontation with the Harbinger, making that our first weekly boss fight for the Nation of Justice. Alternatively, our trial could be at the end of the Archon quests, and we would end up fighting Arlecchino right away. The rest of the Archon quests would then focus on us preparing for our trial and getting help from our new friends. Fosalor's maturity arc would then be the focus of her story quest, where it could be further expanded on away from the other plots. Instead of all of this though, Fosalor could be happy doing what she is doing. In the Varunata Lazarite Gemstone, she describes herself as pure and magnificent, meaning that she could think of herself as above everyone else. She would then be an antagonistic Archon, similar to Raiden A in Inazuma. Due to the strict laws and harsh punishments in Fontaine, there could also be a revolution against her, though this would have to be different from Inazuma's Archon quests. 
This revolution could focus more on Fontaine's upper and lower classes, as well as the strict and complex legal system of Fontaine. The classes could also mirror the speculative battle in the Archon War that I mentioned earlier. The upper class would be represented by Hydro, like the Lord of Amrita, and the lower class would be represented by Geo, like the hypothetical dead god. At some point during this revolution, the Fatui could take advantage of the chaos and steal Fosalor's Gnosis, something which could send her into hysterics. Her reaction against the Fatui could also end up hurting some of her people, causing her to see firsthand that her actions are hurting them, not helping. Her initial reaction to seeing her people hurt could be something like a stunned silence, which would be a slow, yet realistic turn towards her maturity arc. Anyways, I think it's time to talk about the final topic in the plot section. That of course, being Celestia. From what we can see in game, Celestia is currently located above Fontaine, meaning it could have a lot of influence on the nation. We know from the Travail trailer that Fosalor knows not to make an enemy of the Divine, and it can be inferred that she is actually afraid of them. Perhaps the judgment that is soon to come, mentioned by Lieben, actually referred to Celestia, not Fosalor. Now, from what we've seen, Fontaine has a very fancy style in terms of their architecture and fashion, at least above ground. This fancy style gives impressions of beauty and purity, ideas that the people of Fontaine strive to achieve. However, there is more going on beneath this shiny exterior, which is also mirrored in Fontaine's more gritty-looking underground. The nation may have also taken influence from the technology of Conria, as suggested by the lore of Nymph's dream and Renee's investigation notes. Fontaine could be at risk of receiving a divine nail, or more likely in my opinion, there is an inactive divine nail somewhere in Fontaine that the people worry will reactivate. Divine nails are mysterious celestial relics from long ago, which have a variety of unusual effects and powers. Dragonspine is plagued with endless snowstorms as a result of the Skyfrost Nail at its peak. A fragment of the Spirit Stone had strange effects on miners in the chasm, causing the area to be mostly shut down. A Divine Nail was theorized by Sumida and Kama to be the cause of some of Surumi Island's leyline disorders, including the fog. King Deshrit also used the Hadramavith Nail to create the Eternal Oasis, a cemetery for Nabu Malikata that remains frozen in a single moment in time. It's hard to tell what powers the Divine Nail and Fontaine will have if reactivated, so it makes sense that the people of Fontaine would be afraid of it. The experiment that Edwin Eastinghouse was working on before his death could have been related to the Divine Nail, meaning the Nail could have some sort of effect on Fontaine's water. The material Archeum used in this experiment made me think of Noah's Ark and the Great Flood of Christian religion. Perhaps the Divine Nail could cause the water levels to rise, putting the city of Fontaine at risk of being flooded. The Divine Nail was likely active long ago, so there may have been stories passed down through the ages about it. The people of Fontaine may think that if their illusion of purity breaks, the Nail could reactivate and bring a flood as judgment. Now, there is also the topic of the Heavenly Principles themselves, and the possibility of them reawakening. This was teased at the end of the Sumeru Archon quests, with the conversation between Nahida and Atore. Fontaine is the fifth nation on our journey, so it would make sense for things to get very serious. The Heavenly Principles reawakening in Fontaine might be too much for now, though. Instead, there could be a risk of them reawakening, with the Traveler having to work with Fosalor, the Hexenzirkel, and maybe even the Fatui to prevent them from waking up. Either way, it's a cool concept and I really want to see something like it happen. Also, I wanted to bring up the idea that Celestia may be corrupted. Usually, celestial objects have a nice blue glow to them, as seen in Teleport Waypoints, Statues of the Seven, and Divine Nails. However, before they are activated, they instead glow red, much like the Sustainer's cubes in the opening cutscene. So, I think that Celestia could be corrupted in some way, with the red showing that corruption. 
If this is brought into focus in Fontaine, we could finally see the Traveler using their purification abilities again, as after Mondstadt, it was barely mentioned. We could use our purification ability to stop the Divine Nail from flooding Fontaine, or maybe to stop the Heavenly Principles from waking up. There is a lot of potential for Celestia to be a main focus in Fontaine, and it could finally give us more lore on the Primordial One and the Four Shades. My ideas may be crazy, but I'm sure what we end up getting will be even crazier. Anyways, I think that's enough plot discussion, so let's move on over to the characters of Fontaine. This section of the video will focus on the playable characters of Fontaine, as well as their potential elements, weapons, and playstyles. The first of these characters is Fosalor, the Hydro Archon of Fontaine. According to the new Overture teaser, she is also called Furina. Being the Hydro Archon, her element as a playable character will obviously be Hydro. I talked about her earlier on in the video, including her personality. She is prone to hysterics, though she sees herself as magnificent and pure. I think she will likely be a bit more unhinged than the other Archons we have met so far, both in terms of the story and in her gameplay when she's playable. In combat, she could have movements that look graceful and elegant, but something would be off. If she wielded a sword, perhaps she could use it incorrectly in a way. Her signature weapon would be a stabbing sword, while her animations show her using it as a slashing sword instead. She could also wield a claymore, which is close to the elegance of a sword, but much more bulky. Both of these would mirror how she sees herself as pure, but how there are still flaws in her actions. As for her skill in Burst, I think these could tie back into the Slime Theory and her position as the God of Justice. Hydro Slimes are able to imprison players using bubbles, and I think Fosalor could have some sort of imprisoning mechanic as well. Her skill could have her weapon become imbued with Hydro, and enemies hit by the weapon in this state would be marked by a new effect. When her burst is unleashed, enemies marked by this effect would then be imprisoned for a certain amount of time. Enemies who are imprisoned could then receive extra damage from the burst as well. Of course, elite enemies would be able to break out faster than common enemies, and bosses may not be imprisoned at all. Moving on from Fosalor though, the next character I'd like to talk about is the Chief Justice of the Court of Fontaine, Nouvellet. They were first mentioned in Nahida's official introduction, as they gave a quote about her. At the moment, little is known about their personality, but we can speculate from what they say in their quote. First off, they are aware of Nahida and her actions in Sumeru, even giving her praise in her role as Dendro Archon. The court could have a network of spies around Tavat who give them information, which would explain how Nuvalet knew of Nahida's actions. This network could be related to the Lockfolk, or it could just be regular people. Now, Nuvalet also says that Fosalor is prone to hysterics, seeming to lament about it. To me, this makes them feel like a wise elder figure of sorts, one who might be trying to get Fosalor to be less hysterical. Their playstyle could reflect this, with them acting as a support character in combat. As for their element, I think they will be Hydro, just like Fosalor. Nouvellet is the Chief Justice of Fontaine, which is a very high position in that nation. In previous nations, other characters who hold high positions share the element of their Archon. Acting Grandmaster Jean is Animo, Tianxuan Ningguang is Geo, General Kujo Sara is Electro, and former acting Grand Sage Alhatham is Dendro. With this element, their support capabilities could mainly focus on Hydro or buffing stats that are important in Fosalor's playstyle. Their elemental skill could simply involve dealing damage, while also creating stacks of a new mechanic for the character. Their burst could then heavily buff other characters based on the stacks of that mechanic. As for their weapon, I think a claymore would fit them well. 
Claymores are strong weapons, which would reflect the power that Nuvolet holds in the court and the law. At the moment, we also just don't have a Hydro Claymore character, so I'm hoping that either Fossilor or Nuvolet will fill this role. Anyways, the next characters I'd like to talk about are the siblings Linné, Lynette, and Fremenet. Linné and Lynette were both first shown in the Travail trailer as the representatives for Fontaine, while Fremenet was more recently revealed in the Overture teaser. Based on the drip marketing we just got, these three will be playable in version 4.0. Now then, let's talk a bit more about each of these characters, starting with Linné. He is a magician of the Court of Fontaine, and refers to himself as the greatest magician in all of Tevat. Offstage, though, he is a reliable older brother, taking good care of both of his younger siblings. As a playable character, he possesses a pyrovision, which is located on his lower back. For his weapon, I think either a bow or a catalyst would fit his magician theme. The same goes for Lynette, so perhaps one of them has a bow while the other has a catalyst. Speaking of Lynette though, let's talk about her next. She is the middle sibling of these three, and is a lot more low-key than her older brother Linny. When important people visit Linny and Lynette, she takes a back seat and lets Linny do the talking. Interestingly, in an effort to avoid attention, she'll give responses such as entering standby mode or I need to space out. This makes me wonder if she is a robot or a puppet of sorts, similar to Catherine, who also has similar idol lines. Besides this, she also has a few cat-like traits, something neither Linny nor Fremenet have. Although, Linny's constellation name does translate to brown cat, similar to Lynette's, which translates to white cat. As for her being playable, she possesses an animo vision, which is likely somewhere on her back. Moving on though, it's time to talk about Fremenet. He is the youngest of the three siblings, and is also a renowned diver of the Court of Fontaine. While he has an abundant amount of maritime knowledge, he doesn't accept commissions, acting as a lone wolf. He prefers to stay out of the limelight, slipping away to bask in the weightlessness of the ocean. Unlike his siblings who have cat-themed constellation names, his is simply automaton. Perhaps he is an automaton himself, or this could just be referring to his indifferent expression and personality. Maybe these extreme differences between the siblings are intentional though, and the three of them aren't related at all. With Arlecchino interacting with Linny and Lynette in the Overture teaser, or rather wooden stands of them, it made me wonder if these three all came from the House of the Hearth. Anyways, as for Fremenet in combat, he wields a cryovision, which can be seen on the top of his left leg. His art also has him wielding the bell, which means he'll be a Claymore user. Interestingly, this weapon actually has ties to Fontaine, as it belonged to a member of the Wanderer's troop, and another one of those members was from Fontaine. Now, the next character is the only playable character from Fontaine who we have met in the game so far, that being Charlotte. We met her during version 3.7's TCG event, and we learned quite a bit about her. She is a reporter from the Steambird, a newspaper that is based in Fontaine. She is shown to be very passionate about her work, carrying around a notebook and camera to get information as quickly as she can. She also comes up with multiple amazing titles for her articles when she's out in the field. When meeting famous people though, such as the Traveler, Kazuha, A, or Sino, she gets a bit nervous, yet excited at the same time. In the event, we could see that her vision was on the side of her right leg, showing that she wields the cryo element. This is also the first time we got to see the Fontaine vision design, and I really like it. It fits quite well with the elegance of Fontaine, and also has waves on the side that somewhat resemble the ocean's hands. Getting back to Charlotte though, I think her playstyle would involve her acting as a support character. She would deal damage from a distance, with her skill and burst being able to buff other characters. She could also use her camera with some of her abilities, similar to Nahida or the phase trial event. As for her weapon, I could see her using a catalyst. 
We don't have a Cryocatalyst character yet, so it would be really cool to get one in Fontaine, along with a Hydro Claymore character. Her using a Catalyst would fit well with her using her camera and her abilities, and also with the idea of a reporter covering news from a distance. Moving on though, the next character I'd like to talk about is Chiori. She was introduced to us through Kirara, both in a voice line she has about her, as well as her fourth character story. Through these, we learn that Chiori is from Inazuma, but currently runs a fashion label in Fontaine. Chiori cares a lot about fashion, saying it like it is when discussing the topic. When Kirara came into her shop one time, she made her new outfit, as she was embarrassed to let anyone see Kirara walking out of her shop the way she was dressed before. Kirara does say she is very nice though. For her element, I think either Electro, Dendro, or Animo could work. Electro would symbolize her homeland of Inazuma that she is now so far from, while Dendro would symbolize her potential dream to become the best fashion designer in the world. As for Animo, that would symbolize her leaving her home and friends behind to travel the world and set up shop in Fontaine. It's also worth noting that we don't know what shape her vision will have, as it could be the Inazuma style or the Fontaine style. If she got it when she was researching fashion and learning more about it, she could have an Inazuma vision. If it was after she left Inazuma and set up shop in Fontaine, she could instead have a Fontaine vision. As for her playstyle, I think she would be a support character. Her skill in Burst could buff other characters, mirroring how she takes care of people in terms of fashion. She could also wield a polearm, a precise weapon that needs to be wielded with care. This once again reflects on fashion, as both wielding a polearm and making clothes are precise arts. Now, the next few characters I want to discuss are the Fatui Harbingers. I have mentioned four Harbingers in this video, those being Dottore, Sandrone, Arlecchino, and Columbina. Out of these four, I think Sandrone and Arlecchino have the most potential to be playable within the Fontaine updates. Both of them fit into the aesthetics of Fontaine in their own ways, with Sandrone having a steampunk theme and Arlecchino having a theme of false elegance. As I said earlier, I think both Dottore and Columbina will have bigger roles further down the line, and if they did appear in Fontaine, their roles would be minor. Anyways, let's start off with Sandrone. For her element, I think she would use Geo. This would match with the bits of orange in her color scheme, and would also tie into the Guizhong theory. Now, in a Winter Night's Lazo, she is seen being carried by a modified Ruin Guard. Her title of Marionette also suggests that she may be a puppet. Combining these two details, it could be possible that her puppet body is quite frail, requiring the assistance of the modified Ruin Guard. Therefore, I think a Catalyst would be a good fit for her. Instead of rocks in her normal attacks though, she could launch tiny machines or even parts at her enemies that are imbued with Geo for extra damage. For her skill in Burst, she could instruct her Ruin Guard to attack in some way, making her a heavy hitter. This could be somewhat similar to Clara and Svarog in Star Rail, though it may be tough to implement this feature in the open world style of Genshin. Moving on though, let's talk about Arlecchino. I think her element could either be Pyro or Animo. Pyro would match the red bits in her color scheme, as well as her true, fiery personality. As for Animo, it would match the wings on the symbol shown on her outfit. Speaking of this symbol though, Red Gems the wing motif seems really familiar. Oh yeah, D Luke's Red Dead of Night outfit. This theory may be a bit crazy, but what if Arlecchino is actually D Luke's mother? It would explain Crepus having a delusion, and would also explain why Diluc's mother wasn't around when he was young. Diluc's hair also kind of looks like a mix of Crepus's and Arlecchino's, having a similar bang style to Arlecchino, while also having the middle part of Crepus. And do you remember that theory of Diluc's mother being a part of the Hexen Circle, because of the tea set that was only found in Don Winery and the Hexen Circle cutscene? 
well, that would mean Arlequina was once a part of the Hexen Circle. And guess what that symbol on her outfit also resembles? Not only do the wings and the four other objects make an eight-pointed star, but the placement of the red gems matches those found in the symbol in the center of Mona's outfit. Mona is of course connected to the Hexen Circle, so Arlecchino having a similar symbol in the same place is very suspicious. Also, all of this would be supportive of Arlecchino having an animo vision. She would have lost not only her place in the Hexen Circle, but also Crepus, and the opportunity to watch her own son grow up. Yes, this theory is crazy, but I still wanted to mention it real quick. After watching the Overture teaser and seeing Arlecchino's full outfit though, it's making me believe this theory more. There does seem to be either a Pyro Vision or Pyro Delusion on her back, but I'll talk about this more another time. I would be happy to make a separate video on it if you guys want to see that in the future. Getting back to her playstyle though, I feel like it would be refined and elegant, yet still extremely powerful. This would reflect her personality and how she acts refined, but is extremely dangerous under that facade. Her weapon could also be either a sword or a claymore, perhaps mirroring Fossilor. These two both have elegant fronts for their true personality, with Arlecchino's being more fiery and dangerous, and Fossilor's being more hysterical. Now, for her burst, I could see something similar to Raiden's Shogun, Sino, or Dia's burst, in which she unleashes her true personality and power for a limited time. I really hope at least one of these Harbingers ends up being playable in Fontaine, but getting both might be a bit of wishful thinking. Perhaps we will get both of them to be playable in Fontaine, and it will be more common to get Harbingers as playable characters in the future. Now, while I was working on editing this video, we got a brand new trailer for Fontaine. The Overture teaser suitably gives us a brief overview of Fontaine's characters, while also giving little hints towards the story. I'll only be focusing on the characters though, as I don't have much time left to put this together. First up is Clorinda, a character who seems to act as Nouvellet's bodyguard. She walks with Nouvellet in the teaser, before pulling out her gun and taking a shot. This weapon is powered by her Electro Vision, and it is paired with this really cool glass shattering effect, similar to Zila in Star Rail. Now, Clorinda appears to shoot at Navia, another brand new character. She is an elegant character who likes to be on camera, as she is shown getting her picture taken by Charlotte while standing atop a building. She also has a parasol of sorts, which allows her to literally get blown away by the wind. The best part about her, in my opinion, is that she has a geovision. We haven't seen a new Geo character since Yoon Jin in 2.4, so I'm really excited for her. If my theory on the dead god I mentioned being related to Geo is correct, then Navia could be closely related to Fontaine's underworld. Not only does she have a Geo vision, but she also has nautical themes and roses on her outfit. In the 3.8 teaser, a symbol of an anchor with roses could be seen underground. Speaking of visions, it also seems that Fontaine will have two different vision designs, so it'll be interesting to see why. Anyways, the next new character is Sijuane. She looks like she may be a healer when she's playable, especially given her medical hat. She also seems to be part mythical creature, given the ears on top of her head. These ears somewhat resemble those of the Melazine, so she could be related to them. As for her element, it wasn't revealed in the teaser. I think she could be Animo, as she may have lost her family some time ago, but Ryuthisle took her in. Dendro or Cryo could also both work. Speaking of Ryuthisle though, he is the next new character. He looks to be a seasoned warrior of some kind, having a lot of scars on his body. For his element, I think either Geo or Pyro could fit. Geo would fit with his calm demeanor, and Pyro would fit with him being a seasoned warrior. I also think he might know Diluc, given the chains on his outfit, as well as the suit and coat. 
Perhaps he is a part of the secret underground organization that Diluc is in. Moving on though, there was also a character named Agiriad mentioned in the description, who was likely the one talking over the first scene. She was not shown though. Anyways, that's all I have about characters, so let's move on to the environment. The environment section of this video will be focusing on Fontaine's geography, settlements, creatures, and more. To start this section, I'd like to introduce a small segment I like to call Where into Vat. This segment will focus on speculation of where certain locations will be relative to the current Tevat map. First up, we have Chenuvale. Now, Chenuvale is a part of Liyue, not Fontaine, but it will likely act as a gateway to the nation of Hydro, so I wanted to mention it. In the world quest in Artist Adrift, Julian says that he traveled through Chenuvale from Fontaine to get to Sumeru. He also says that when he stepped into Sumeru's bounds from Chenyu Vale, the sandstorms immediately picked up. As such, Chenyu Vale very likely shares a border with the deserts of Sumeru. This means Chenyu Vale could stretch across the area above northern Sumeru, perhaps all the way to the Girdle of the Sands. Now, we are also told of places called Chowing Village and Yilong Port that are located somewhere within this unreleased area of Liyue. While we aren't given much information about Yilong Port, we are told that Chaoying Village is in northwest Liyue, and that it borders Fontaine. This places it somewhere between Liyue, Sumeru, and Fontaine, with it being possible for Yilong Port to be in the same area. Up next is the Nation of Justice itself, Fontaine. We know that it is north of Sumeru and that it also borders Chenyu Vale and Chaoying Village. This does give us a few reference points, but doesn't tell us how big it really is. Given the size of Sumeru, it's possible that Fontaine could stretch from the Girdle of the Sands all the way over to Old Mondstadt. Of course, Fontaine won't release all at once, and it will take a few updates for us to see just how big this nation truly is. If Fontaine is as big or even bigger than Sumeru, we could also see some unique areas, especially closer to other nations. Fontaine likely borders Shnizhnaya to the north and Natlan to the west, so cold or volcanic areas may be possible. Anyways, the final area I'd like to locate is Celestia itself. From what we see in game, Celestia is currently located north of Sumeru City and west of the Spiral Abyss, placing it above Fontaine. Its location could be slightly modified to account for Chenyu Vale, depending on how big that area ends up being. Speaking of Chenyu Vale though, I'd like to talk about just how we'll get into Fontaine. There are a couple of areas that we could travel through to reach Fontaine, so let's get into those. The first of these areas is of course Chenyu Vale, and by extension, Chowing Village in Yilong Port. As I said, Chaoying Village is located in northwest Liyue, and borders Fontaine. However, this area is not in the game at the moment, not even with the version 3.8 update. It could be added in version 4.0 alongside Fontaine, though that makes me wonder just how much content we'll be getting in terms of exploration then. Either way, if Chaoying Village ends up being the way to go, we could have a prologue Archon quest through the village and into Fontaine somewhat similar to what happened with Inazuma. After all, we haven't been to Chaoying Village yet, and with it being mentioned so much, it would feel weird to just walk right through it to go into Fontaine. Now, if Yilong Port is also in the area, we could travel there during this prologue Archon quest to take a ship across the water and into Fontaine. Now, I don't think Fontaine will be quest-locked behind this prologue, and we'll hopefully just be able to swim over ourselves. Doing the prologue quest would just be necessary to continue the story, not the exploration. Now then, the other area that could act as a gateway to Fontaine would be the Girdle of the Sands. It is possible that this area also borders Fontaine, and the river that flows past Forukasha Oasis could originate from the nation. 
However, this area is far more remote than Chowing Villages, making me think that this won't be the entrance we take in the Archon Quest. We could still travel through here at some point though, perhaps in an Archon or Story Quest to return to the Harvestockum. All things considered though, Chowing Village is most likely our way in. Once we're in Fontaine, one of the biggest sights we see is likely to be Fontaine City. We got a look at the city in the 3.8 special program teaser, which showed a lot of cool things. There is a clothing store that could belong to Chiori, as well as artificial rivers or aqueducts that lead into the city. We also see that the city is surrounded by big walls on all sides, which suggests that the city could be partially below the water. Perhaps on the lower levels, we'll be able to see through the walls and into the water. Back on the surface though, we get a look at a fancy building that I think could be used for musical performances. There are stylized organ pipes on the top and sides of this building, which suggest a link to music. It is possible that this is the Court of Fontaine as well, but I feel as though the court would be far bigger. In front of this building though, there is also a fountain. This fountain could be the Fountain of Lucine that is mentioned in Renee's investigation notes. Now, the city as a whole is extremely fancy in terms of architecture, while also having a main color scheme of white, blue, and gold. However, we also see an underground portion of the city that appears more industrial. There are worn down wooden bridges, big pipes and machinery, as well as water that looks a bit dirtier. This could reflect on Fontaine's class system, with the above ground area representing the upper class, and the underground area representing the lower class. Getting back to the city as a whole though, Alice mentions a location known as Flu of Sandra. This could either be the name of a river that flows through the city, a section of the city, or even the city as a whole. Whatever the name of the city is though, many different species call this place home. We see plenty of humans in the teaser, but we mainly follow around a member of a new and quite interesting race known as the Melusine. The Melusine patrolled the city of Fontaine and likely other areas as well, but I'll talk more about them in a little bit. Besides the Melusine and humans, we see some dogs that look quite fancy, as well as robots walking around. As for its relation to Celestia, it is possible that the city is located beneath the heavenly abode, or somewhere close by. Perhaps these towers seen in this wide shot may have been used to communicate with Celestia long ago. Moving outside the city though, there is going to be quite a bit to explore. Fontaine appears to have a good amount of mountains, including rolling hills that turn to sharp peaks, and huge mountains that tower over the landscape. Between these hills and mountains, we are also likely to find a town known as Petricor. Petricor is Xavier's hometown, and he tells us a bit about it. The town is known for its beauty, as well as its exceedingly pure waters. Xavier also tells us of a majestic waterfall that he has a view of from his study. The term Petricor itself also refers to the pleasant earthy smell that occurs when rain falls on dry soil. With all of this considered, Petricor sounds like a quiet and cozy town, and I can't wait to get a look at it. Besides towns though, we may also come across some relics from the Archon War. Throughout this video, I have mentioned a giant bone that can be seen in the background of the 3.8 teaser. I believe that this bone belongs to a long dead god, similar to Orobashi in Inazuma. We could also find some consecrated beasts in the area that fed on the dead god's remains. Now, the area these bones are found in could be the site of an ancient battlefield. It would be really cool if some scars of war are still visible in the area, showing how much the Archon War affects Tevat to this day. Outside of this area, we will likely find other ruins sprinkled around Fontaine as well. These could include castles or settlements ruled by long-dead gods who were slain in the Archon War. We could also get more bits and pieces of even further ancient civilizations, similar to those that once inhabited Dragonspine and Ankonomiya. Now, Fontaine's exploration won't just be limited to land. 
as we've seen in the teasers so far, Fontaine will introduce underwater exploration to the game. This underwater area is shown to be vast and colorful, with a large variety of fish and other sea creatures, as well as some ruins here and there. At the moment, it's unknown how big this underwater area will be, but it is possible that it will stretch all across Fontaine. Maybe in the future, it could also be introduced outside of Fontaine. I think it would be really cool to explore the underwater area between Liyue and Inazuma, though that may be wishful thinking once again. Anyways, I mentioned that the underwater area has a few ruins that can be seen here and there. Perhaps this underwater area could hold the entrance to another ancient underground civilization similar to Ankonomiya. Like Ankonomiya, it could be based on Atlantis, but instead of being dark and gloomy, this one would take a lighter route. This ancient civilization could be located within a hidden glass dome underwater, allowing some natural light to still get in. There could even be potential for people to still be living down here, praising a certain god for protecting them. This certain god could be Istaroth, as she has helped out other ancient civilizations before. As for where it would be located, I think an ocean between Fontaine and Natlan would be the perfect fit. Atlantis was said to be located in the Atlantic Ocean, so this place would be in Genshin's equivalent of that ocean. Of course, an area like this would probably be released in the later half of the Fontaine updates, so we'd have to wait a little bit. Moving above Fontaine though, I think it's time to talk about Celestia once again. As I've said, Celestia is located somewhere above Fontaine from what we see in the game. As for its exact location, it could be right above the city. This would explain why the people of Fontaine are so antsy of upcoming judgment, as well as their fashion and desire to appear elegant. The desire to appear elegant also applies to Fosalor, who is wary of the divine. Alternatively, it could be located above the Celestial Lake. Back in Inazuma, Xavier talks about a lake that held the reflection of the stars and the moon, such that walking along its banks was like treading amid the celestial skies. This definitely sounds like somewhere Celestia would be above, and would also fit the Hydro theme of Fontaine. There could be a good amount of celestial ruins within Fontaine, especially in this lake. Perhaps there is even a divine nail in the area, either in the celestial lake or even in the city itself. As I said earlier, it could be inactive at the moment, but would still play a role in the story. This lake could also be home to ruins of some other ancient civilization that was destroyed by Celestia using the Divine Nail. We could even get another mural room in this area, giving us even more lore on the heavenly abode. Now then, it's time to talk about the creatures that we may encounter in our travels across Fontaine. Starting with the Melusine, they patrol the city of Fontaine, and perhaps other areas of the nation as well. It's possible that they will act as Fontaine's Aranara in a way, living underwater similar to the Aranara in the forests. While their World Quest series may be long like the Aranaras, it would still likely provide important lore for Fontaine, which will be very fun to look into. As for other sea creatures, we got to see a few within the teasers so far. New types of fish, manta rays, crabs, and even seals are going to be introduced in Fontaine. We also see what appear to be hydro mimics underwater, with this new hydro crab that was briefly shown. Of course, there is still room for more underwater animals, such as jellyfish or dolphins. There would also be some new fish unique to fishing in Fontaine that would require a new type of bait, just like in Sumeru. On land, we would likely see the return of common animals from around to that, including boars, birds, and more. We could also get new varieties of some animals, including birds such as seagulls or pelicans, and the hydro crystal fly. Perhaps we could even get new lizards that can run on the water, as some lizards can do that in real life. Fontaine could also introduce some brand new animals that haven't been seen in any other nation thus far. 
We could get bears, deer, and maybe even horses so that Kaya isn't a cavalry captain in a world without horses anymore. Also, the Gannett, because I saw them while researching this video and they're amazing. Now then, it's time to move on to the enemy section of the video. This section is mainly speculation and will cover my ideas for potential common and elite enemies, as well as world bosses and weekly bosses. Starting with the common and elite enemies, I think Fontaine could introduce some variations of already released enemies. We could get Hydro Hillichurls, Midichurls, and Laurichurls, as well as different elemental variations of the rogues. Rogues and Midichurls together do cover the seven elements already, but it could still be possible for us to get new variations of each. I would also like to see a Pyro Samatrol, as it's the only elemental Samatrol that we don't have. Hydro Whopper Flowers would also be an interesting addition, and would tie into a world boss idea that I have. For the Fatui, I would like to see a Hydro Cetian Mage. Hydro Cetians have been in the game since launch, so maybe it's finally time to get this enemy. In reference to the dead god I've mentioned, we could also get Geo and Cryo Consecrated Beasts to finish the set. With variations out of the way though, I want to talk about my original ideas for new enemies in Fontaine. First up, we have Elemental Phantoms, which I based on the Marchose Phantom mentioned in Nymph's Dream. They are the spirits of fallen officers or soldiers who took on elemental power over time. At this point, they would barely be human and would not hesitate to attack. Like Slimes and Spectres, they could have a variation for each of the seven elements. Now, the next common enemy would be Hydro Creatures. These would be similar to the Oceanid's Hydro Mimics, but they would be able to exist on their own. I got this idea from the new Hydro Crab in the 3.8 teaser, as I thought it could be possible for them to exist above water as well. I'm not sure how extensive underwater combat will be, so I think having them above water as well would work best. There could also be mimic creatures formed out of other elements, such as Pyro or Electro. Now, I'd also like to quickly mention the underwater machine shown in the 3.8 teaser. While these do appear to be hostile towards the player, I don't think they will give drops. They may act more like the Eye of the Storm, only giving the occasional artifact drop. I would love to be proven wrong about this though, as the drops could look really cool. Moving on to elite enemies though, the first idea I had was for celestial powered machines. These would be robots built centuries ago as concepts for new technologies. They would be powered using energy from a divine nail or another celestial artifact, making them extremely powerful. Up next, we have the Abyssal Gargoyle. They would be abyssal creatures that resemble small dragons, and would often be found perched on high places. I got this idea not only from real-life gargoyle statues on buildings, but also from Durin. As such, these creatures would also have been created by Rhinedaughter. Similar to the relationship between the Rift Wolves and the Golden Wolf Lord, the Abyssal Gargoyles would be less powerful versions of Durin. They would still be dangerous, potentially being able to inflict corrosion, but they would not have the absolutely devastating venom that Durin had. With those out of the way though, I'd now like to talk about world bosses. I have come up with four ideas for new world bosses in Fontaine, and I really like them. First on the list is the Hydra Regisvine. This monster formed from a vine that absorbed the essence of pure water that flows through the ley lines. Due to the pollution in Fontaine, this creature could be struggling. Perhaps the fight could be somewhat similar to the Dendro Hypostasis, in which we will have to lower its health to Comet before attempting to help it. At the end of the fight, we would use Hydro abilities to purify the creature, after which it will return to slumber. As for its abilities, they would be similar to the other Regisvines we've encountered so far. It would have a shield that could be broken by attacking a core, a slam attack, and variations of elemental attacks. With Hydro, it could use waves of water against us, 
as well as concentrated water to deal more damage. Now, the next idea I had is the Lockfolk Swarm. This would be a group of smaller Lockfolk, probably three, that remained deep within the waters of Fontaine. They could be found in a cave under the water, allowing us to walk around for the fight instead of swimming in the water. Unlike the Oceanid, the Swarm won't just throw Hydro Mimics at us and then fly around. Instead, each member of the Swarm will take turns attacking the player. It could be similar to the Beist fight, with each of the Lockfolk having a different health bar. Unlike the Vishap herd in Ankonomiya, you would not need to kill them all in quick succession. They may still be able to summon Hydro Mimics, but instead of being the main focus of the fight, they could be ignored. However, they could provide buffs to the Lockfolk, so it may be smart to take a few out. Still, I think that this sounds quite a bit less annoying than the Ocean It's Hydro Mimics. Moving on though, the next world boss idea is that of a Phantom Captain. This boss would be similar to the elemental phantoms I mentioned earlier, but it would be far bigger and clearly less human. They would have been a captain in the war they died in, causing them to gain power in the afterlife in a desire to avenge their fallen soldiers. With this, they may be able to harness multiple elements, similar to a few other bosses. Like the Primogeal Bishop or the Iniquitous Baptist, this boss could have a randomness factor with its elements, having them change each fight. It would also be cool if this boss could use elemental weapons like Child, and if they would switch fighting styles based on the element they currently possess. For the final world boss idea that I had, I came up with the Abyssal Dragon. Like the Abyssal Gargoyles, this would be a powerful and dangerous creature that was the result of an experiment conducted by a great sinner. They would be less powerful than Durin, but more powerful than the Abyssal Gargoyles. After leaving Conria, it would eventually settle deep underground in Fontaine, where it would stay for centuries. Perhaps it could reside closer to Sumeru in the Girdle of the Sands, and therefore closer to Conria. In battle, it could induce corrosion like the Rift Wolves, or potentially even a new effect that is unique to this boss. Now then, it's finally time to talk about the next weekly boss. For those of you who have been watching my content for a while, you know that I love speculating on the next weekly boss. And for those who are new here, welcome! I love speculating on the next weekly boss. Anyways, I think the trend of a Fatui Harbinger being the first weekly boss in a nation will continue with Fontaine. As for which Harbinger it will be, I'm leaning heavily towards Arlecchino now. I follow the theory that she is number 4 of the Harbingers, and I think it would make sense for us to scale up in the numbers in each region. We fought 11 in Liyue, then 8 in Inazuma, and 6 in Sumeru, so I think 4 in Fontaine would fit quite nicely. So, let's get into how the fight would work. In her first phase, she would remain calm and collected, using the weapon she would have if she was playable. For this battle, I think a sword would fit best. Now, instead of attacking us and making the first move, I think she would wait for us to get close and attack, then strike when she sees an opening. Her attacks would be swift and merciless, with her quickly lunging towards the player with her sword. Even so, we will beat this first phase and move on to the second. In this second phase, she would put away her elegant cover and unleash her true self. She would utilize her delusion in this phase, and perhaps some of the powers she would have learned if she was a member of the Hexen Circle. While her attacks would still be powerful, they would be less precise as she lets her anger take over. Her attacks could be a mix of melee and ranged attacks, with her using both her sword and her abilities as a mage. Instead of attacking with her mage powers though, she could use them to weaken us or make her attacks more powerful. Either way, this fight would certainly be a fun one. As for the other Harpingers I have mentioned, Sandrone and Dottori don't seem very likely to me. Their themes are mostly on technology and mechanics, and we just got a mechanical weekly boss with Scaramouche in Sumeru. As for Columbina though, 
I have considered her for this weekly boss in the past. After thinking about it more though, Arlecchino just seems to fit the role in Fontaine better, and Columbina would be more suited to a fight later on in the story. If she did have a weekly boss fight though, I think her second phase could have her transform into a biblically accurate angel, referencing her potential connections to Celestia or Istaroth. I've talked about these connections in another video, and I recommend you check it out. As for the second weekly boss of Fontaine, I think it's too early to talk about that now. We don't know much of anything about Fontaine's lore or what kind of enemies the nation has seen, so I think it would be best to save that for later. Don't worry though, I will make a video on Fontaine's second weekly boss, just as I did for Inazuma and Sumeru. This will be a few updates into Fontaine, likely a few versions after the first weekly boss is released. It may come earlier if I get a good amount of ideas though, we'll just have to wait and see. Anyways, over an hour in and we're finally at the last section of this video, the culture. This section will be going over the various different aspects of Fontaine's culture and what we know about them. Of course, there will also be a bit of my own thoughts and speculations in here as well. Starting with the legal system, we are told by Yanfei that the law is notoriously complex in Fontaine. This does make sense, as Fontaine is ruled by the god of justice after all. However, the system is also rather strict as well, with individuals being judged even on their responsibilities in certain tasks. Patrice tells us that even the tiniest infractions are considered crimes that can come with severe punishments if not handled properly. For example, academic researchers in Fontaine have to be mindful of their spending, as they could potentially be charged with wasting public funds or misappropriating academic resources if they're not careful. Patrice goes on to say that these crimes are punishable by bankruptcy at best. Now, before the Cataclysm, the Lock Folk served the previous Hydro Archon as her spies. She sent them around the world in order to connect everyone the way water is connected. However, they do not follow the current Hydro Archon, and likely no longer have influence in the nation's legal system. We do know of a group that does have an influence though, that being the Melazine. From what we've seen, the Melazine act as police officers, patrolling various areas of Fontaine City, and likely other areas outside of the city as well. If they live underwater, they could even patrol within the lakes and rivers. Law is quite a big part of Fontaine's culture, and so is technology. Fontaine is quite an advanced nation, which is shown through their many inventions. While they aren't as advanced as Shnezhnaya, they still have incredible technologies. This advancement in technology was pioneered shortly after the Cataclysm by Elaine Guillotine. Elaine may have taken inspiration from Conrian technology, which is hinted at with the lore of Nymph's Dream and Renee's investigation notes. As I said earlier, this could put Fontaine at risk, especially with Celestia located right above the nation. Back to Elaine though, he also founded the Fontaine Research Institute of Kinetic Energy Engineering, which still operates to this day. Fontaine's technology as a whole is now used in many other nations around Tafat as well. There is of course the Makaja Furnace in Inazuma, which is currently overseen by Xavier. When the furnace went critical and threatened to leak to Tarigami energy, he quickly put up a containment barrier and began working on a device to purify the dangerous energy. Other inventions include the camera, which is commonly used all across Tavat. There is also a variant of the camera known as the film camera, which allows for the creation of videos and movies. We have also had various events where engineers from Fontaine bring their creations to other nations, including Evermotion Mechanical Painting and Core of the Apparatus. Back in Fontaine though, their industrial revolution has led to some negative side effects. Santon describes the air in Fontaine as toxic, and the water is likely affected as well. There was also recently an explosion at the Fontaine Research Institute, 
which took the life of senior technician Edwin Eastinghouse. On a lighter note though, it's time to talk about fashion in Fontaine. The people of Fontaine are almost always formally dressed, wearing suits with bow ties and hats, or big fancy dresses. The playable characters that we have seen also wear fancy outfits, including Liney, Lynette, and Charlotte. When we ask Francis about the fashion, he says that some people from other countries may find our dress sense showy and impractical, but for us, there is nothing more commonplace. As for why this is commonplace, we're not quite sure yet, but I think it may have something to do with Celestia being right above Fontaine. In fact, the clothes in Fontaine aren't the only things that are fancy, as Fontaine's architecture is quite refined as well. Fancy buildings with gorgeous and unique designs can be found all around, and they seem almost futuristic. Interestingly, the mainly white, blue, and gold color scheme matches with that of Celestia. Also, the people we saw in the underground area were much less dressed up than those on the surface. They were wearing outfits more akin to working clothes, which could represent the class divide that I've mentioned. Their less fancy outfits also match the underground itself, being a lot grittier than the surface. Now then, I'd like to discuss the Steambird next. The Steambird is a newspaper that hails from Fontaine, and is read all across the seven nations of Tavad. Columnists also write for the paper from each nation, including the column All Things Astrological, written by Mona in Mondstadt. The Steambird also has reporters who cover news stories from all across Tavad. Charlotte, who we met in version 3.7's TCG event, is one of these reporters. While she was working on covering the TCG tournament across Mondstadt, Liyue, Inazuma, and Sumeru, she also got the scoop on some mysterious stolen cardbacks. The reporters are great at what they do, and can find good stories anywhere. Interestingly, the Steambird has also reported on the travelers' adventures throughout the nations they've visited in Tavad. With this in mind, it could be possible that we'll be famous in Fontaine, as some people would recognize who we are. Perhaps some reporters would even try to follow us, hoping to see us in action and get the next big story about the mysterious traveler. Overall though, the Steambird could play a key role in Fontaine's Archon quests, as it would give us the details of what is happening in Fontaine, which we could use to our advantage. Finally, it's time to talk about the music of Fontaine. While it may seem unlikely due to its elegant appearance, Fontaine is actually where rock and roll originated in Tibet. Then again, Fontaine will likely have themes of revolution, and some classic rock songs are known for the rebellious themes. Either way, rock and roll has started to spread around Tibet, as shown with Xinyan and Liyue. Now, Fontaine is also the home of the Iridescence Tour, an international music tour that is planned to involve all seven nations of Tavad. Unfortunately though, things haven't exactly gone smoothly in the plans. Jinyan was meant to attend the tour in Inazuma, but it was cancelled suddenly, possibly due to the Sakoko decree not being lifted at the time. It was then planned again, but it was cancelled once more soon after. However, the tour finally got its time to shine in version 3.4's Lantern Rite. In this event, Jinyan bumped into Dvorak and convinced him to hold the show during Lantern Rite. With the help of the Liyue Chising, the tour was a success at the event. Perhaps we'll see Dvorak and the Iridescence Tour return in future updates with more music. I think it would be really cool to see them once again. Anyways, that's pretty much everything we know about Fontaine, as well as the speculations I want to talk about. Of course, there may have been a few things I missed here and there, so let me know if I did in the comments below. Also, there are likely going to be more teasers for Fontaine that I obviously can't cover in this video, but I will be talking about them over on my Twitter, live on Twitch, and in my Discord. I am also going to be taking a little bit of a break from making videos, so there won't be any coming out next week. 
I should be back after that, but if anything changes, I'll keep you guys updated. If this video somehow wasn't enough and you want more of my thoughts on Fontaine, I recommend checking out my Fontaine Speculations miniseries. I also have videos on Nymph Stream, Borokash's Glow, and many other topics that I discussed in this video, so I recommend those if you want more information. I would love to hear your thoughts and ideas for Fontaine in the comments below as well. Anyways, that's it for this video, thank you so much for watching. Sources and further readings are also in the description if you want to check them out. I hope you all have an amazing day, and I'll see you all in the next video.